You know, our favorite albums don't just live inside of us. Sometimes we want to sort of live inside of them as little sort of micro worlds of sound and music. So three examples I've got here that for me live inside of me, but also create this otherworldliness that I want to almost like climb into. Cocteau Twins, Heaven or Las Vegas. Kaput by Destroyer. This is beautiful. This is such a lovely record. I, I mean, this is an audiophile friendly kind of record. So if you're a kind of Diana Krall type listener, you might like that. You probably won't like this though. This is Robert Liner's Visions of the Past from the early 90s. Seminal ambient techno album, very hard to find. And again, it creates this sense of another world that we want to step into. So better hardware, like these final audio headphones, allow us to go further into these little micro worlds that these albums create so that we might find like a, a hi-hat tucked away behind the couch or deeper bass beneath the floorboards. It's kind of like a, living in a space, you know? Better hardware creates a better sense of space, of separation, of detail retrieval, and then tone and timbre. But I like gear, especially when I'm listening at home to these records, these CDs. I like gear that allows me to go further into those albums. Now when Ken Ball of Campfire Audio last year, so in 2018, told me about a forthcoming new flagship, IEM, that he was making, I kind of almost shrugged and went, eh, whatever. Because the Andromeda, as much as I like it for detail and for layer separation, I don't really love it for its tonal qualities. I find them a bit lean. Um, and I, that's why I keep coming back to the Polaris 2, because also these have more low end punch. I know they're goosed that way, but they have more punch and they have a better tone. So these have become my everyday IEM, much more so than the Andromeda. I find the Andromeda very detailed, but I would call them somewhat mathematical, a bit sciencey. They're tremendous for people who are looking for accuracy but that's not really my end game. I'm a pleasure seeker, not a truth seeker. Now the benefits of being a pleasure seeker is that we get to spend half the money. I mean, these are sell for about 500 bucks, the Andromeda for a thousand. Um, but the price of that, the price of saving money is that these aren't as transparent as the Andromeda. Neither are they as good with micro dynamic inflections. This is an all balanced armature earphone. And I tend to find that they can sound a little bit too clinical and anemic at times. And they lack the punch and the dynamics and sometimes the warmth of a dynamic driver, which is what we find in the Polaris 2. Well, the Polaris 2 also has a, um, a balanced armature. It's a hybrid, but we'll get to that. So an all balanced armature IEM to me can sound seriously impressive, like really, really impressive, like technically amazing very often they keep me at an emotional distance. And that's why I tend to steer away from them, especially at the high end. And we're talking about expensive IEMs here. And that emotional distance is why I don't use the Andromeda on a daily basis. Um, it's why I much prefer the Polaris 2, the blue one, not the green one. But when Ken Ball told me more about his forthcoming IEM, I learned that it wasn't going to be an all balanced armature affair like the Andromeda, the green one. It was gonna be a hybrid like the Polaris, the blue one. And it would also be eye-wateringly expensive. So if value for money is of paramount importance to you, you can pretty much stop watching here. So this is the Campfire Audio Solaris, their new flagship IEM, hybrid design, and it sells for, wait for it, 
1,500 US dollars. 1,500. The Andromeda was a grand, or was it 1,100? 1,100, but this is like a, another jump again. Now, if you look at these, you might think, well, how, they can't cost 1,500 US dollars to make. But that's a very simplistic way of looking at the world because the profit margin that Campfire make on these has to pay for their Portland offices, their Portland workshop, and their staff. So that's American land costs and rental costs and American labor costs, not Chinese, because this is all handmade in the USA in Portland. So you can see this is quite a large earpiece and it contains four drivers. So we've got two balanced armature drivers for the top end. Then there's a single balanced armature, I think that's vented, for the mid-range. And then for everything else, including proper anchoring of the lower frequencies, there is a dynamic driver. I think it's a one centimeter dynamic driver as well, so it's quite large. So that probably explains why this earpiece is a little bit larger than the other two. Now the other thing that we're paying for here is extensive R&D. So this isn't just a bunch of drivers inside an earpiece, each one crossed over with a crossover. There's only one crossover in here. The rest of it is taken care of by tuning the driver's response acoustically. So for each of the two balanced armature drivers that take care of the treble, there is something called a tuned acoustic expansion chamber, which Ken Ball has developed to extend their response upwards. And then also the cavity into which the, the dynamic driver plays, that has also been tuned. So there's a lot of work that goes on in maximizing the potential of these drivers inside the earpiece. And that's really what Ken Ball is known for. And I think this is what he spent a lot of time working on with this Solaris. You just don't get that level of R&D with a Chi-Fi IEM. And neither do you get a cable like this. This is Ken Ball's Super Litz cable, which is essentially four braided strands of silver plated copper. Many people will know Ken Ball kind of made his reputation in the audio world or partially made his reputation by designing cables as ALO audio. So this is not just some, this is not just any old cable. This is a proper high-end cable. Of course, some of you hate cables. That's fine. Just don't bring it to my comment section, please. Anyway, three and a half mil jack here, this TRS, single-ended, and then connecting each earpiece is an MMCX connector, which is pretty standard for uh, campfire earphones. Clips in. I do have one niggle about this cable, or more about the, uh, the over-ear sheathing like this, because it, it, it's very hard to get it into sort of an ear shape. It doesn't really have a natural ear shape, and when I'm bending it over my ears, I really have to sort of bend it back like that so that I can get a proper secure fit. Now talking of fit, inside the box, we get a good number of tips like this. I think this is a final audio silicon tip, yeah. Um, this is the extra large one. And what's really interesting about this is that when I put these into my ears, I get one of the best seals I've ever had. These new tips that Campfire are now supplying a standard are absolutely superb. I get better noise rejection than I do with any other IEM that I've ever used, and also better than any kind of noise cancelling IEM that I've ever used. I'm looking at you, Sony. So noise cancelling isn't just about electronics and circuits and things like that. It can also be passively done, and the campfire do it really, really well. Although I will say that when I'm walking out and about in the street, I do have to push these in a bit further than I do at home, not really to reject more noise or to kind of shield me more from the outside world, but just so they stay in better. They kind of come a bit loose unless I push them kind of far in. So yeah, you have to work hard always to get a decent fit. These are probably about average for the amount of time I take to get, a, get that fit. But um, yeah, once it's in place, happy days.
Now you can see here that the Polaris 2 has a smaller earpiece than the Solaris. Polaris, Solaris, it's easy to get them confused. Um, this one, I would say, this smaller size is more comfortable for the long haul. It's easier to get a good seal, a good fit. I don't have any problems with having to push these in further out in the street. I have to pay special attention to these because they're a bit bigger. So that's, you know, it's, it's, it's something to consider when moving from these to these. Now, I don't think the Solaris are as fussy as the Andromeda with sources. I mainly use my LG V40 smartphone, which has a decent DAC and a decent headphone amplifier in it. Um, but when I move this plug from that phone into a MacBook 3.5mm socket, I didn't hear the big drop-off in quality that I was expecting. And also that the drop-off, I mean, yeah, it's there, but it's not enormous. And it's not as large as that which I hear when I move the Andromeda from the LG to the MacBook. So how do these new Solaris sound? Well, I could tell you they have like superbly extended highs and a, a punchy, well-textured bass and, you know, but it's not really telling you very much, is it? I mean, yeah, those qualities can exist, but I could be describing pretty much any IEM. And I think that's how I described the Ibasso IEM in my last video about products like this. So, in talking about these, I, I can only do so in relation to the Andromeda and the Polaris. So the Polaris has a serious amount of low-end kick, and the Andromeda has lots of transparency and layer separation. And the Andromeda also has a lot of clarity, which these don't really have, but what the Polaris have is lots of tone. We get to hear music's color more evidently with these. And that may be because they are colored. I don't know, I don't, I don't even care really. But the thing is, is that we're forced to choose one or the other with these. So the Andromeda has the clarity that I like, but sometimes that can come across as a little bit soulless. And then the Polaris has the sort of fleshiness and the warmth that I crave but that can lead to a more congealed sound, a, a more sort of smushed together kind of presentation. The layers, that is. The layers are, sound a bit, yeah, a bit like mashed potato sometimes. That's not a good image, is it, really? But I love these earphones. I like these, but I love these. Now, you might think, well, what the hell has that got to do with the Solaris? Well, it's because the Solaris don't force us to choose between all of those good qualities and they dispense with some of the lesser qualities. So with these I get high transparency, I get that big punch in the low end, I get a bit of warmth, I get a bit of fleshiness, I get a super extended top end, I get all of the good stuff that the other two give us but in separate models and it all comes together in this one model. So in many ways, this is a no compromise IEM. And these are also absolutely excellent with tone and timbre, the color of music. I don't feel I'm being shortchanged with these as I am with the Andromeda. Now, like the LCD i4 from Audazy, this is a pair of IEMs that I would happily have stand in for a pair of full-size headphones. But the difference between these and the Audazy is that these don't let in noise and they don't leak noise. So you can use these on a plane, on a train, you can use them out in the street, and because the seal is so good, you get that really immersive experience. I mean, <laughs> it's amazing how much sound you can carry sort of inside your own head. Like you can step into the music. Remember at the start I was talking about how you could almost climb into the sound of a record? And that really speaks to this earphone's best quality, and that's the size of its head stage, but also its depth. It creates this, almost this like massive new room. It's like kind of like this, for music to sort of spread out so we could like live inside the music as well as the music live inside us. So in that respect, this is an IEM that you could probably use for mastering or mixing a record. So if you're a professional, these might suit your needs very well. And if you travel a lot, 
these can go with you. So if you're somebody who mixes and masters on the road, you could just pop these in their travel case and off you go. No need to have a big pouch full of full-size headphones. I should clarify though, we're talking about professional people mixing and mastering as well as home listeners or everyday consumers. I don't want anybody to think that these earphones are somehow cold, cool, um, overly analytical just because they can be used as a professional tool. They're not at all. There's a hint of warmth to them. Not as much as Meze's Ray Penta, which are probably the closest rival to these right now, and neither do the Solaris have that jaw-wide mid-range that the Meze give us. But that's a story for another day. We'll come to the Meze Ray Penta in another video. So if these new flagship IEMs from Campfire were a loudspeaker, I would probably liken them to a Magico or a Wilson. So highly detailed, highly dynamic, very immersive, fantastic layer separation, full range for a fully engaging listening experience. I mean, I don't feel like I'm missing anything when I'm listening to these. Obviously, if something better comes along, that'll tell me what I'm missing. Now, because of their retail price, the value quotient here just isn't there. These are not the best value earphones on the planet, says Captain Obvious. But they are some of the best sounding IEMs on the planet. If you like this video, please give us a thumbs up down below. Um, if you have a question, I don't know if I can help you because you're probably going to ask me, how does it compare to this IEM? And I don't know because I haven't heard that IEM. And if I had it here, I would include it in this video, but I don't, so I haven't. Um, so if you understand that, that my experiences are limited to the gear that I have access to, and really I only get to hear like 1% of gear released every year. So if you get that, please subscribe to this channel. Don't forget that I also have a website. The URL is darko.audio. It's called darko.audio. And again, if you want to leave a comment down below, and I would, you know, if you want to say something, please make sure it advances the conversation. Please make sure it's not just some kind of simplistic thinking like going that's a ripoff because anybody could say that and it shows you haven't thought about anything at all and it probably means I won't even approve it actually because all comments are moderated I do read all of them I only reply to a few that's not because I'm ignoring you it's because I just don't have the time because once this video goes up I'm kind of already on to the next videos pre-production scripting and things like that so I don't have a lot of time to really kind of just sit there and answer questions and comments and things like that. Well, this is a long outro, isn't it, anyway? But so, if you could take all that in, once again, thank you so much for watching. Mm -hmm.